to the choir master, according to the Gittith, a psalm of David. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings, and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands, and you have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. chair was so deep it was almost a mistake to sit in it. <laughs> um, you find the uh, session we're on tonight is, um, which page? I can't find. 22. Session 3, 22. And keep Psalm 8 open in front of you. I was... I was preaching in a church in the lower Blue Mountains, uh, just west of Sydney. And I noticed it was an evangelistic kind of gathering, and I noticed one of the guests sneaking out to uh, smoke a cigarette. Uh, poor smokers, don't you feel bad for them these days? They're, they're like lepers. They kind of can't do it publicly in anywhere. They've got to, so I, I went out to, to go and sit down with him and have a chat to him and uh, try and reach the leper with the gospel. Uh, we were just changing names and kind of getting underway in the discussion and uh, kind of into, into a relationship of any way. And a little girl came along who was about uh, four years old. And she came up to us and started asking the kinds of questions that four-year-olds ask. You know, what, why? The poor man, he really was very sad, very embarrassing. But the conversation ran something like this. What's that? A cigarette. What are you doing with it? I'm lighting it. Why are you lighting it? So it's to smoke it. Why are you smoking it? Because I want to. Why do you want to? <laughs> now at this point, you could feel the poor man. He was, he was like a kangaroo caught in the spotlight. You know, he... His dignity was slowly disintegrating. <laughs> there was nowhere you could go. You know? Why do you want to? And so he gave up. Oh, well, because I'm stupid. <laughs> Why are you stupid? <laughs> it wasn't the most effective, successful evangelistic context in which to share the gospel with the poor man. See, there's nowhere to go when you're confronted with a small child committed to declaring that the emperor has no clothes. Now, children are not smarter than the ad adults. They're not more humble than adults. Uh, they're not more innocent than adults. Children just lack the sophistication. They don't know how to lie subtly how to allow and preserve the dignity of the other person by using the sophistication of deceit. The old rule used to be that uh, children should be seen but not heard. The modern form of censorship is a bit cruder. It's called cancel culture, as you come to point one on the outline. Cancel culture is when somebody mentions the unmentionable truth. When somebody speaks clearly what we don't want to hear or have said, we turn to censorship. I mean, censorship is the knee-jerk reaction of the insecure, of the threatened, of the, the authorities, of the mindless mainstream. See, I hate people speaking badly of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
rubbish in the name of the man who died for me. But I also hate censorship. How can we be certain of the truth if we can't be challenged and tested by anybody? How can, we, how can I hear the weakness of, anti, of the anti-Christian argument if I'm never allowed to hear what their critique is? How can I avoid brainwashing or even worse, culture washing, if I silence any alternative, any other view than, than my accepted view? See, it's the weak who bully people. It's the insecure who censor people, who shoot the messenger rather than engage with the message. When I'm seeing you are very dark tonight. Have we got not the house lights on? Can you read your Bibles all right? Yes? Good. It's just the bright lights on my face. I, I can't see you. That's a shame. Oh, no, I, I can, yes. What lovely looking people. Okay. When... That's the capacity for deceit. Um, when... <laughs> When Jesus came to Jerusalem and cleansed the temple, you see the chief priests and the scribes, the the authorities, reacting with typical censorious insecurity. See, Jesus was bringing the kingdom of heaven into the world, cleansing the temple of the money changers, declaring the true purposes of God's house, of the house of prayer, healing the victims of the fallen world, the blind and the lame, and doing wonderful things of the kingdom in plain sight of everybody. And the little children were crying out in the praises of God's salvation, Hosanna to the Son of David. Son of David. You know what they're meaning by that, don't you? Hosanna to the Son of David. Anybody could see the wonder of God's salvation, and the children didn't hold back. They could see what it was, and they sang the obvious truth. But then we meet the insecure bullies who are hearing them, the threatened chief priests and the scribes who hear the children calling out, Jesus is the son of David. And their indignation, they couldn't have that, and so they try and get Jesus to silence the children. But in this insecurity... They actually want to silence Jesus, don't they? They they don't want him to be praised. They want him to be cancelled. And in a few months' time, they do. They cancel him properly by crucifixion. Jesus, though, on that occasion responds with a wonderful retort, for he quotes our psalm psalm for today, Psalm 8. Yes, have you not heard? Out of the mouths of babes and infants and nursing babies, you have prepared praise. It's so hard to cancel or censor the little child who sees the obvious truth and declares what they see. God, in fact, has prepared the children to praise him in order to silence his foes and enemies. You and I, sadly, we all too often practice self-censorship because of what is called our emotional intelligence, which is a nice term used to mean uh, the sophistication of deceit. We always go, and this is not the moment. You know, it's not the occasion, not the time, not the moment for adoration, for boldness, for conversation. This is the moment to keep your mouth shut. This is the moment to change the subject. This is the moment to look the other way. This is the moment to build a bigger relationship, a longer relationship. This is the moment. But the small girl asks, why are you smoking the cigarette? The small child cries out, Hosanna to the son of David. (laughs) For the small child knows and sees the obvious truth and knows that when you see the truth, you speak the truth. You declare to whomever is listening what is the obvious truth. As such, the children in their praises are fulfilling the psalm, which has as its beginning the actual theme of the psalm, the major theme of the psalm of the praise of God. This is a psalm about the praise of God. Look at verse 1. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. 
You have set your glory in the heavens and go down to the end, verse 9. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. It begins and it ends with the same point because that's what the whole psalm is about. The beginning and the end, the praise of God. Now let's analyse these two verses for a moment. They both start with Yahweh, Lord in the uppercase, because we don't want to say the name Yahweh and so we put it in the uppercase. Because the name Yahweh is a name, it tells you who God is, whereas the word Lord in the lowercase, is a, he's a master, it tells you what he is. It's like my name, my name is Philip and I'm a man. A man tells you what I am, Philip tells you who I am. And so you depersonalize God if you always use Lord rather than Yahweh. So I'll try and use Yahweh for you to help you personalize what is actually there in the text. It, so Lord our Lord is really Yahweh our master. It changes the feel of it. Yahweh is the one who rules and governs the affairs of Israel. And what we would say is Jesus Christ is our Lord. But you've got to remember, Lord is not a title. Lord is the reality. The Lord is the boss. The Lord is the one who tells you what to do, and you do it because he is the Lord. Jesus said, many people will call out to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name, do mighty works in your name? And I'll say, depart from me, you workers of lawlessness, because they do not do what the Father wants of them to do. So the psalmist addresses Yahweh as our Lord. But he's saying more than that. He's really saying, Yahweh is the Lord. How majestic is your name in all the earth. Yahweh is the king, the ruler, the master, the king of kings and the ruler of rulers of the earth. Remember how in Philippians 2, you see Paul promises the day when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess, Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So here in Psalm 1, the psalmist moves from the majestic name of God to his glory in the heavens in the second half of verse 1. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You'll set your glory in the heavens. For the heavens declare the glory of God. The sky above proclaim his handiwork. It's like the praises of the 24 elders in Revelation 4 singing the praises of God. Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honour and power, for you created all things, and by, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. See, for what can be known about God is plain to humans because God has made it plain to humans. He has shown it to us in his works of creation. But people in our wickedness, suppress the truth. We censor the truth. Go back to Psalm 8. You see, the psalm moves from the praise of the heavens in verse 1 down to the great truth of verse 2, that God has appointed the little unimportant, unsophisticated children to speak his truth in the face of his enemies. For the child sees the wonder of God in creation. The child sees it with wonder and praise and adoration, whereas the sophisticated, educated, elite peoples of the adult world suppress the truth. And we do it so long and so often that we no longer even see the truth. Uh, George Orwell, remember in 1984, Animal Farm, that man, George Orwell, he put it this way, some ideas are so stupid that only intellectuals believe them. I think that should be put as a graving over the front gates of universities. <laughs> as Paul puts it in Romans chapter 1, for although they knew God, they did not honour him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man, birds, animals and creeping things. 
Or again, as he says to the Corinthians, for since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. Now, that's a complex sentence, that one, isn't it? Let's look at it a little bit more carefully here for a moment because it's actually one of the most important verses for university students and the staff to ever understand. For since in the wisdom of God, this is God's wisdom, this is God's choice, this is how God thinks it's best. In the wisdom of God, the world will not know God by wisdom. Ponder it, you see. You will never get to know God by human wisdom. Because God chooses not to be known that way. That's a terrible insult on those who think education is going to lead us to the ultimate truth, isn't it? Because if God is true, then we'll never get that that way. The psalmist then turns to verses 3 and 4 to the puzzle that makes this psalm very famous. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you're mindful of him or the son of man that you care for him? But we must remember to put this puzzle in the psalmist's context of the little children praising God, silencing, stilling, humbling God's enemies. See, the puzzle presents the contrast between the heavens and the humans. The heavens, the moon, the stars are so vast and expansive and we are so puny and small and, and little, like, actually like children. We, we think we're more than children. Think again. What place has humanity in the universe? It's the puzzle that's continued to plague the great minds of humanity in their arrogance as God's enemies. The atheists who deny God and his glory struggle with it. Let me start with a local atheist, Philip Adams. He wrote a book, uh, Adams versus God. He says, my main point is to communicate to people how inadequate religion is as a description or explanation of the cosmos. There were, at last celestial census, 1,000 million, million, million suns out there. It will take a zero or two. And that's just the universe we can dimly perceive with our senses and instruments. Unless we're extremely agile and lucky, humans will be a brief-lived life form on an attractive planet on one of those millions of suns. That's it, friends. That's what we are. That's what you are. You are a brief lived life form. That's all we are. Nothing more than that. Forget about morals. Forget about meaning. Forget about purpose. Forget about, about being an individual. Forget about your personality. Don't worry about finding yourself. That's all a waste of time. You're no different to the ant and the cockroach or the maggot that will one day feed on your corpse. A brief lived life form on the edge of nowhere. The American humorist H.L. Mencken summed it up this way. He says, summing up the cosmos is a gigantic flywheel making 10,000 revolutions a minute. Man is a sick fly taking a dizzy ride. Religion is the theory that the wheel was designed and set spinning to give him the ride. So that's what we are in the atheist thinking. That's what you are. You are a sick fly taking a dizzy ride. That's all we are. Forget love. Forget justice, forget truth, forget freedom. Well, they're, they're all nonsense. They don't exist in any form at all. You are no different to the mosquito that sucks your blood. There's an alternative atheistic view. You see it in the 19th century English poet and writer, Algernon Charles Swinburne, who parodied the angel's hymn at the birth of Christ. You know, glory to God in the highest... And, earth, and on earth, peace and people of goodwill. He wrote the lines, Glory to man in the highest, for man is the master of things. We're not the nothing of the vast universe. We're the greatest thing going, because we're the greatest brief life form. We're the greatest 
sick fly. I mean, he was more like the ancient world Pythagoras. Man is the measure of all things, the things that are than things that are not. So you see here, we're the measure, we're the standard of all values and meaning and purpose and reality. We who, on one hand, are absolutely nothing, are actually everything. There's nothing outside us by which you can measure us or challenge us or hold us to account or above us. Or We are the ultimate in the whole universe. We sick flies. Let me give you a more Australian way of saying it, the very egalitarian, faux egalitarian way, because egalitarianism is so important to us. Gough Whitlam was the former Prime Minister of Australia and he was asked, what would he, what would he say, what would he do when he met his maker? And Gough replied, you can be sure of one thing, I shall treat him as my equal. Arrogance unlimited is the atheist world. The elite who will not listen. So what are we, we humans? What are we? Important enough to look God in the eye? The measure of all things? The sick fly taking a dizzy ride. But here's the puzzle of the psalmist that he sets for us. When you look up at the nights of the sky, the millions of stars that you see there, knowing that you're only a very small, small part of one, what are we that God should care for mankind? That God should think even of humanity? That God should even think of you or listen to your prayers? The puzzle is heightened by the ambiguity of the singular. The singular noun, man, and the singular prayer noun, him. Is the psalmist asking, what am I? Or is he asking, what is humanity? For God created a united, single humanity in his image. And are we talking about man or humanity? Are we talking about the son of man or human beings. Uh, following the Hebrew, the ESV uses the old-fashioned word man, which I put in as a capital M to make sure it's clear, that is, in the generic sense of human, not in the gender sense of male and female, that's nothing to do with what we're talking about here, the generic sense of man, humanity. Like the old-fashioned word for race, I don't know if you know the old-fashioned word for race, but the word race actually used to mean the human race, as opposed to the animals. These days it's used to talk about one kind of ethnic group as opposed to another ethnic group. And so we're talking about race. You should never be a racist. Christians aren't racist because we believe there's only one race, the human race. But as the language has moved away, we've created another thing called racism, which is of a different character at all, and we shouldn't be racists because we believe all one created under God, all one for whom the Lord Jesus would die. We're anti-racist. Anyway, it's the same kind of problem with this word. Our appointment in verses 6 to 8 is over all the other creatures, which reminds us of Genesis 1:27. You know, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over everything that, mo that moves on the earth. I mean, clearly Genesis 1, the generic man, refers to both male and female. And the verse jumps between him and them as it's trying to make clear that we are one in God's image, male and female, when God created man. Back to Psalm 8, where the basis of the puzzle is the apparent greatness of man. I'm on point four in the outline as you're turning the pages there. The greatness of man in the context of our insignificance in the universe. But what is the greatness of man? 
Verse 5 tells you. Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honour. Verse 5 is the key answer to the puzzle. God has made man a little lower, or the text actually said he's lowered man in his creation to below the heavenly beings. Humans are not God. We're not angels. We're not spirits. We're creatures of this world, just like the animals are creatures. Created in this world, not in the heavenly councils. The word for heavenly beings is the Hebrew word gods, which gives us a theological problem because we believe there's only one God. But within the Bible, there are many gods, many lords, many false gods, and the devil himself is called the god of this world. The the word god, G-O-D, just means a supernatural ruler. And so, yes, the devil is a god. But he's not the God of gods, he's not the Lord of lords, he's answerable to the great God who is the one true God. And so the word could be translated here, God. In fact, the ESV uses the word heavenly beings, the NIV uses the word angels, and the American Standard Version uses the word God with a capital G. So you can't translate perfectly. Right? Each of these I could argue for and justify in a different context, a different moment. Because it's a little difficult to know what to do with gods, which is what the Hebrew word is saying. But while the first half of verse 5 points to our lowered state below the gods, the second half points to our elevated state, crowned with glory and honour. The glory and honour that we have is spelt out for us then in verses 6 to 8. For God has given us dominion over all his creatures, land, sea and air. They're all under man's dominion. Which brings us back to the theme of the psalm. So, verse 9. Which, of course, is the the chorus. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Because just as God appoints infants to speak his truth, to silence his opponents and his enemies so also God has appointed puny little man to have dominion over the world. It's our place in creation that shows how great God is. It's our place in creation that shows how greatness actually comes from God's appointment, not from our abilities, not from what we do, but because God has made us to be crowned with glory and honour. And that therefore shows how great God is in all the earth. It means that, with apologies to Alexander Pope, the proper study of man is not man. The proper study of man is God, who reveals himself in the scriptures. I've just claimed theology over anthropology, in case you didn't notice it. So, let's take a little quick summary, nine-point summary, in an excursus on the place of man. Are we ready? A little excursus. Nine points. One, we are creatures of the Creator. Two, we're not accidents of an explosion. Three, we are unique in our relationship to God. Four, we're unique in our relationship to creation. Five, our place is given, not achieved. That's a great leveller. Huge leveller, isn't it? I don't know what you've achieved, but you're no better than me. I don't know what I've achieved, but I'm no better than you. Our greatness comes from our appointment, not our achievements. And so, number six, our abilities result from our appointment. They don't lead to us. You don't become more human by playing cricket for Australia. It's a good chance you become less human that way, but you won't become more human that way. Right? Whatever you do doesn't make you any greater. No, no, what you do, you do because God has appointed you to do it. Not, that's not the way you become to the appointment. 
Very different to almost every job you'll ever get, won't you? Yeah? My CV is created by God in his image. My CV is not all my degrees. They don't matter. All my accomplishments, they, they come from being appointed. Number seven I'm up to. We're given, therefore, tasks and responsibilities and are held accountable for them, which eight, therefore, means we're not meaningless. We have a purpose uh, that we have, which gives us in point nine, not inherent, that's my misspelling, inherent, we have an inherent basis for morality in our creation. The moving from is to ought is a great philosophical puzzle that the atheist never works out. The trouble is our is, our is is appointed by God that we ought. We have a basis for morality that the atheist does not have. And that's why the Christian and the non-Christian world hits the conflict in the areas of modern morality and ethics today. For if we're simply accidents of the explosion, then there's no meaning, there's no purpose in life, and there is, if no meaning and no purpose in life, there's no basis for morality or for ethics or for humanity. Humans have no special place in this universe and we have no special responsibility. Atheism is totally without any morality. Now that sounds fairly extreme. Some would feel bigoted view, negative view of atheism. So let me show it to you out of the atheist mouths. Here's a few quick quotes. I could spend the rest of the evening on this because there are so many. Richard Dawkins. The universe we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if, at, but if, it, if there is at bottom no design, no purpose, no evil, no good. Nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. There, in the atheistic world of Dawkins, there is no such thing as evil. There is no such thing as good. There can't be. Of course, the only thing that is, is is. Professor Alex Rosenberg, philosopher in Duke University, wrote a book called The Atheist Guide to Reality. He asks a series of questions which he then answers. What is the meaning of life? There is none. Why am I here? Just dumb luck. What happens when we die? Everything pretty much goes on as before, except us. And then he asked the question, is abortion, euthanasia, suicide, paying taxes, foreign aid, or anything else you don't like, forbidden, permissible, or sometimes obligatory? Anything goes. That's atheism. Whatever you like. Anything goes. There is no right, there is no wrong, there is no justice, there is no truth, there is no love. That's all just, that's just your grey matter giving false answers to you. It doesn't exist. Professor Joel Marx was a professor of moral philosophy who went through a terrible conversion in his late academic career. He, he had always argued for morality, but he came to the conclusion, I was a moral fool. Why? My shocking epiphany was that religious fundamentalists are correct. Without God, there's no morality. Spent his lifetime arguing for morality, only to discover it didn't exist. Without God. So what did he choose to do? Accept God? Don't be daft. He accepted amorality. Stayed at home for a year to try and work out what it meant. So... If you can't have morality without God, how do you account for the universal morality, the character of it everywhere? Professor Jesse Prince of City University in New York correctly says, objective morality requires a benevolent God, human nature, an innate sense of moral values, and rational principles like logic and arithmetic. But of course, Jesse Prince doesn't believe in God doesn't believe in human nature and doesn't really believe in rational principles like logic and arithmetic. So why do we have it? Well, he gives the answer. No amount of reasoning can engender a moral value because all values are at bottom emotional attitudes. The judgment that something is morally wrong 
It's an emotional response. Ooh, I don't like that. Well, that doesn't make me happy. Tell that to the victims of crime. Tell that to the victims of evil. Just say to them, your calling out for justice is being just emotional. Get over yourself. You know, stop it. Take a, take a chill pill. There's nothing wrong with what they did to you when they tortured you. Torture's not wrong. You just don't like it, that's all. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just you've got an emotional reaction to these things. And all right. Here's the problem for Luke Ferry, another atheist, a, a French secular hu humanist philosopher who wrote a lovely book called The Brief History of Thought, very good book. In the light of the massacre at Bosnia, he wrote, the theses of materialism itself quite simply prove unsustainable. When you look at what was done and the horror of the torture that was used in that massacre, no animal could do it. But if an animal did it, you'd say, oh, well, that's just bad luck. But to say in humans it's just bad luck, he says, it doesn't make sense. Materialism doesn't make sense, which is very difficult for a man who's a materialist to write. Lord Denning was one of the great jurists of the 19th century in uh, England, of course. And he warned us in the 20th century, I say 19th, 20th century, he warned us years ago, about the 1960s, without religion there can be no morality, without morality there can be no law. And if religion perishes in the land, truth and justice will also. Hello, the new world of post-modernity and the struggles we have when there is no truth and there is no justice. Just everybody's opinion. You see, the atheist dream is really our nightmare. Without God, there's no meaning. Without meaning, there's no morality. Without morality, there's no justice. Without justice, there's just unrestrained power. Justice becomes social engineering, and all government becomes tyranny. That, my friends, is atheism. They are very big at telling us what's wrong with them, but ever ask them what's right, what they believe, and you'll find out what they believe is hideous beyond belief and stupid as well. Sorry for using the word, but it is just so rank nonsense when you ask them to go in the positive and tell you what they believe. Read their books, I do, and what they put forward is nonsense, inhuman, immoral nonsense. So come back to our psalm, for it sees humans as different by God's appointment. So when we look at the rest of the Bible, when we look at the reality of human history, like the Bosnian massacre or Hitler or Mao or Pol Pot or Stalin, what we see is not honour and glory, what we see is the failure of man. The failure of man is seen repeatedly in the scriptures when Israel entered into the promised land, they go into a Garden of Eden setting where they're going to be God's people living in God's land, living God's way, but they fail completely to live God's way. And so they are dispossessed from the land. They don't continue as God's people. They choose to live their way, and so they live outside the garden, outside the land, as they get sent off by the Assyrians and the Babylonians, because God punishes them. This national failure of Israel is matched, and is matched by, in the moral and spiritual failures of each one of us. For we all choose to please ourselves rather than God. As the scripture says in Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The problem of the world today are not the results of bad people. They're the results of all people, you and me included. We don't see everything in subjection to man. We don't live in the Garden of Eden. We now live under the curse of death. 
as Romans 6.23 says, the wages of sin is death. We're all sinful and the wages of sin is death. I mean, the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, but that comes later. So we live in a world of war and disease, of famine and fire, of pestilence, of earthquake, of thorns and thistles, of mice plagues and viruses, of cockroaches and maggots, of the ever-present fear of death. That's the world we live in, and it's not got any better, it's not got any worse, it just is the way of the world. And these failures are ours, they're not other people's, yours and mine, we are the people who ruin society, we are the people who ruin our environment, saying that, oh, look, I'm not as bad as Hitler or Stalin. Well, he's not saying all that very much, is it? Given the power and authority and opportunity they have, if I had that, I wonder what I would do, whether it would be any better. See, the battle of morality is a spiritual battle, not simply a humanistic one, as if all trying harder would, would make us better. Is if putting into the curriculum more kind of morality and ethics would improve our children at school. <laughs> it never does. All it does is it means that we don't learn any history, maths or English. Because we're so busy on civics and we're so busy on these moral campaigns that never actually make any difference. All we wind up is very well-educated criminals. And the battle for mortality is a spiritual battle, not a... It's, it's not a medical one, as if experimenting further, we will find a way to become immortal. Those poor people frozen in, 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 in a cyrogenic kind of plan that somehow down the future we will gain immortality in our bodies. No, our failure is our rebellion, our rejection, our ignoring of God by believing the lies of Satan. And if we fight against our addiction to sin, if we battle against our slavery to Satan, we're only further defeated in both our morality and our mortality. But as Martin Luther's old hymn has it, for us fights the proper man whom God himself hath bidden. Ask ye who is this same? Christ Jesus is his name. He and no other shall conquer in the battle. Everybody here who's over the age of 45 is hearing it in our minds. All those under the age of 45, if you're hearing that song as I said it, I'm glad you're going to a good church. Now, <laughs> turn with me to the letter of Hebrews, chapter 2, verse 5, where Psalm 8 is quoted. For it was not... For uh, Hebrews, Hebrews, where's Hebrews? It's here before 1 Peter. I'm giving you time, aren't I? Hebrews 2. For it was not, verse 8, it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come of which we are speaking. It's been testified somewhere. What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You've made him a little lower then a little while lower than the angels, you've crowned him with glory and honour, putting everything in subjection under his feet. So far, so good. This is the glory of man of Psalm 8, isn't it? God's aim was to bring glory and honour to man in our creation by subjecting all the world to us. But then comes the terrible realisation of failure in verse 8, the second half of verse 8. Now, in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside the control, his control. But at present, we don't yet see everything in subjection to him. Okay, here's where we see the failure of man. Made to be glorious in control, but through sin failing to live in control. And then comes the breakthrough, when Martin Luther's proper man arrives. But we see him, verse 9. We see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus. Not mankind now, but him, the singular man. Not just any man, but that man, the man, Jesus. But we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honour. At last we see Man, the man, as he was created to be, crowned with glory and honour, Jesus Christ, our Lord. 
Here is the proper man, the true man, the real man, the genuine man, the right man who came into the world as a human made, a little lower than the angels, but now crowned with glory and honour, to whom every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And look at the reason why he has been crowned here in this passage. Why has he been crowned? Because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. Because of the suffering of his death, not simply his death, but ours, because he was tasting death for us, for everyone. See, the greatness of God is not seen in the, in the superheroes and their superpowers that fill our screens and childish imaginations. The greatness of God is seen in the man who was and is the image of God, Jesus, the Christ, the image of the invisible God, hanging on a cross in the throes of death. There is the greatness of man. The man who saw equality with God, not as a something of snatching, but serving, humbling himself, to be a slave even to the point of death on the cross. He is the one to whom God is placing all his enemies under his feet. For the greatness of God is seen in the elevation of that humiliated man, Jesus proclaimed in the mouths of infants and babies. There is the greatness of man. There is the dominion that is given to man. A wonderful book by an atheist, Tom Holland, not the young person, Tom Holland, the historian. A wonderful book that he's published in the last year called Dominion. For he sees that though he's an atheist, in all his life, he's a Christian in behaviour. Why? Because Christianity has founded Western civilization with all its morality, all its values. Without Christianity, there are no morals, there are no values for a society. But his are Christian morals, Christian values, not because of the Greeks, not because of the Romans, but because that man died on the cross. It was the crucifixion that has changed the whole nature of human history. And you see man in his greatest when this man, the man, the proper man, the only real man should die for the sins of others. God's majesty is not found in signs and wonders and miracles. God's glory is not found in the wisdom of debaters. You don't have to have all the answers to preach the gospel, my friends. It's not wisdom that is ever going, it's not apologetics that's ever going to convert anybody. That's not where it's at. Rather, God's majesty and glory is found in the foolishness of what we preach, in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. For that is where true greatness of humanity is seen not in the cleverness of our proclamation, but in our childlike proclamation of Christ Jesus, Son of David, the Son of Man. That is where it's at. And if a baby can do it, so can you. Someone's going to come and lead us in prayer, aren't they? presume that's what's going to happen. A song? Well, then I'm going to lead in prayer. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for all the things you give to us, but above all, for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that he was made a little lower than the angels, but that you crowned him with glory and honour. And we thank you, Father, that we see your greatness and the greatness of your name, not in the achievements of humans,
but in the appointment of humans. And we see your greatness in overcoming the failure of humans in the greatness of your son who tasted death for all of us. We thank and praise you, Heavenly Father, that he is indeed King of kings and Lord of lords and we bow our knee before him this day when we sing with our tongues this night that Jesus Christ is Lord to your glory and we praise you, Heavenly Father, and thank you for the salvation that he won for us and we praise you and thank you in his name. Amen.